Our ability to manipulate genes can be very powerful. It has been very powerful. This is going to revolutionize human life. Would the consequences be bad? And they might be. Every time you monkey with the genome, you are taking a chance that something will go wrong. The technique could be misused in horrible ways. When I started this research project, you know, kind of had this initial feeling of what, what have I done, you know, and... <laughs> CRISPR gene editing technology is a tool that scientists can use to change the letters of DNA in cells in precise ways. So I like to use the analogy of a, a word processor on, on our computer. So we have a document, you can think about the DNA in a cell like the text of a document that has the instructions to uh, tell the cell how to grow and divide and become a brain cell or a liver cell or develop into an entire organism. And it, just like in a document, uh, the CRISPR technology gives scientists a way to go in and edit the letters of DNA, just like we might cut and paste uh, text in our, in our document or uh, replace whole sentences, even, even whole paragraphs or chapters. We can now do that uh, using the CRISPR technology in the DNA of cells. CRISPR is an acronym that actually represents a sequence of DNA letters in the, in the genomes of cells. It, it's found in bacteria and was interesting to scientists originally because it's a bacterial immune system, a way that bacteria can fight viral infection. For scientists, this is sort of a, you know, a, um, uh, really a gift that allows uh, research to proceed very quickly in terms of understanding the genetics of cells and organisms, but also provides a very practical way to solve problems. In uh, clinical medicine, the opportunity to make changes to blood cells that would cure diseases like sickle cell anemia, a disease where uh, you know, we've understood the genetic cause for a long time, but until now there hasn't been a way to actually uh, think about treating patients. And now with this technology, it's possible in principle to remove stem cells that give rise to blood cells in a person's body make edits to those cells that would correct the mutation causing uh, sickle cell disease and then replace those cells to essentially give a patient a new set of cells that don't have the defect. It's one thing to talk about being able to remove mutations from the, the human population that cause genetic disease and I think for many people that would be a desirable thing to do. On the other hand, it's very, I think it's a very different, uh, different uh, discussion to think about uh, using a technology like this to create uh, enhanced human beings, people that are taller or have a certain eye color or, or other kinds of physical or, or intellectual traits that might be considered desirable. Um, and, uh, you know, it sort of immediately brings up uh, 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 sort of the, the whole area of eugenics and, and uh, sort of access to technology, who gets access, who pays for it, who decides, who decides uh, whether or not to, to do such a thing. Should companies be allowed to offer this as a service to parents who want to do this? And, you know, if so, should they be regulated in some way? I, it's a, there's a lot of very interesting and challenging questions, I think, that go along with that. The technique could be misused in horrible ways. It could be misused, for example, to create biological weapons, to create new forms of threats to human beings, threats for which we don't have any known antidote. Or it could simply be used to create human beings of far superior capability. Not just taking genes and removing defects, but adding new super capabilities. What if in the process of that kind of gene editing, we created a caste society where some people were genetically designed to do menial tasks and didn't have the capability of doing anything else? And other people were designed to be the rulers uh, with huge IQs and the capability of understanding things beyond the pale for lesser humans. The ability to edit our own genomes is one thing we ought to 
worry about. I'm not sure it's so much an ethical problem as a, as a, um, a, a, a more practical problem. What, what would the consequences be? Would the consequences be bad? And they might be. I think it's worth noticing that long before CRISPR, long before we became capable of editing our genomes in any way, we have been editing the genomes of domestic animals and plants by artificial selection, not artificial mutation, which is what we're now talking about, but artificial selection. When you think that a Pekingese is a wolf, a genetically modified wolf, modified not by directly manipulating genes, but by choosing for breeding individuals who have certain characteristics, for example, small, snub-nosed, etc., and making a, a wolf turn into a Pekingese. Well, we've been doing that very successfully with domestic animals like dogs, cows, domestic plants like maize, for a long time. We've never done that to humans, or hardly at all. Hitler tried it, but it's never really been properly done with, with his humans, I'm glad to say. So if we've never done that with humans with the easy way, which is artificial selection, it's not obvious why we would suddenly start doing it the difficult way, which is by um, genetic direct genetic manipulation. So there doesn't seem to be any great eagerness to do it uh, over the last few centuries anyway. People uh, think that uh, introducing traits into offspring is a form of eugenics and is uh, on a slippery slide to Nazism. I happen to think that that is a bogus ethical argument, but it is by far the majority ethical argument. And um, in many countries, uh, genetic enhancement is or will be illegal, uh, and uh, it's going to take a, a huge force to o overcome that. Just as cloning is illegal in virtually every country, and in when Dolly the Sheep was cloned in 1997, uh, there were confident predictions that there's nothing you could do to stop human cloning. It was just around the corner. And uh, here we are, uh, almost 20 years later, and it has not happened. Uh, also, the uh, task of uh, uh, engineering high intelligence is turning out to be a lot harder than uh, one might have thought. In the late 90s, uh, it was thought, well, sooner or later you'll we'll find some high IQ genes, they'll give you, uh, you know, three or four points, you put in uh, a handful of them and you get a much smarter uh, baby. There was going to be the gene for musical talent and the gene for athletic coordination. We have every reason to believe that those traits are substantially heritable. Uh, we've known that for decades just because of twin and adoption studies. On the other hand, we also know that the genes responsible are going to, each one of them is going to have an eensy weensy effect. And there are dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of them. So making your child smart is not a question of putting in one high IQ gene. It may be a question of putting in a hundred genes or a thousand genes. Every time you monkey with the genome, you are taking a chance that something will go wrong. Also, those genes, the ones that we have identified, and we've made enormous progress in uh, just a few years ago, there was not a single gene you could point to that had a positive effect on intelligence. Now we can point to a few of them. They have, you know, eensy weensy effects, a third of an IQ point. Uh, but on the other hand, we identify them by their correlations with intelligence. We have no idea what they do. I mean, if you find that any of those genes is actually expressed in the brain, then you've had a really good day as a scientist. But to know what the totality of their effects are, positive and negative, is something that we're not going to know for a long time, if ever, when you're talking about hundreds or thousands of genes. How do we know that one of those genes that get, raises your IQ by a third of a point uh, doesn't also increase your chance of epilepsy or schizophrenia or brain cancer. What do you think for that matter that parents are going to be willing to uh, take such chances with the biological integrity of their children that in exchange for an increase of an IQ point or two, they're going to take some unknown risk of making the child schizophrenic or uh, bipolar or, or um, uh, some other disease who we, that we may not know of whose probabilities we don't know? Not so clear that they will. The road to eugenics was, was paved with the best intentions. And it was a series of, you can almost see the world tipping towards horror, step by step by step. You know, it seemed like one iterative step didn't seem that much. And yet, as you accumulated all of these, very soon you went from, you know, in Nazi Germany in particular, starting with trying to uh, eliminate or sterilize uh, those who um, were somehow physically uh, different from others, all the way including uh, folks who were deaf, uh, folks who had various neurological diseases, and then sort of marched 
inexorably towards um, other forms of identity, including obviously Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and so forth. Um, so um, it's worthwhile remembering that that progression that occurred in the 1930s um, was, was perceived by the citizens at that time as part of a progression. So it's in incredibly important to remember that history when we step as we are going to, as we're stepping towards the genetic modification of human embryos, or even to some extent the genetic modification of other animals or plants. We have to remember that it seems as if there's a progression, but all of a sudden, by the time from the beginning to the end, you may land up in a very different place. It's, it's, it's important also not to throw, as we enter new genetic technologies, not to throw the baby out with the, the genetic bathwater. I mean, it's important to remember that, there's, that our ability to manipulate genes can be very powerful. It has been very powerful. This is going to revolutionize human life. It's already beginning. It's going to mean that all of the genetic defects that have caused so much pain and suffering for people for millions of years, all of that could potentially be removed. So why does the great woman who invented this wake up in the middle of the night worrying about it? When I started this research project, we were certainly not thinking about uh, technology that would allow alteration of, of, of human evolution or anything of that nature. And over the last uh, few years, when, as this technology has begun to uh, be deployed globally in different, uh, for different applications, I've found that I have gone from, you know, thinking about it initially just with, you know, sort of almost, uh, you know, wide-eyed excitement, thinking about all the opportunities that this offers, to realizing that, you know, there was real risk and that, that we really needed, we meaning the scientific community and really, frankly, the, the human community needed to be aware of this and discussing it. And one of the things that, that sort of brought that to the forefront of my mind was a dream that I had uh, fairly early on in which I was, uh, you know, I walked into a room and a, a colleague of mine said to me, uh, Jennifer, I'd like you to explain the CRISPR technology to a friend. And he brought me into a room and uh, there, a person was uh, sitting with their back to me. And as they turned around, I realized with sort of a hor hor horror that it was, it was Hitler. And it was actually Hitler with a sort of a pig nose and it almost looked like a chimeric pig human uh, sort of sort of creature. Uh, and it was, it was, you know, it sounds funny in a way to relate that image, but it, in the dream it was a terrifying thing. And I, I really felt real, just, you know, stone cold fear in the dream and, and sort of woke up from that dream with a start and, and realized, you know, kind of had this initial feeling of what, what have I done, you know? And <laughs> And that was really one of the things that, that, uh, that, that motivated me to, you know, to get out of the lab and start talking to people more broadly about the technology, about its capabilities, about the great things about it, but also about things that really required uh, really uh, deep thought and, and careful uh, consideration and regulation. I think, you know, with any new technology, one always has to try to get the balance right. On the one hand, we, of course, want to see technologies and, and science in general being used to solve real world problems, uh, real human problems. But on the other hand, we want to ensure that that progress is responsible progress, that we are working together with uh, stakeholders to ensure that, the, that uh, there's not an unintended or even a, a negative intended consequence of, of the use of these technologies. How to do that is a big challenge. Get smarter faster with new videos every week from the world's biggest thinkers.